So good afternoon. My name is Christopher Lupp. I work at um, AFRL and specifically the RQVC branch, which uh, some of you may know as Mystic. Um, so I'm going to be giving you two presentations today. Um, they're actually somewhat related to each other. If the, oops, they want the slides. Just a minute as we uh, sort sort through the Fair enough. sort through everything. Okay, start again, please, if you okay. would, Chris. And do you have the clicker up there, by the I way? I do. Okay, fantastic. Okay, well, let's start again. So, as I said, my name is Christopher Lupp, and I work at AFRL on the RQVC branch, which some of you know is Mystic. I'm going to be giving you two presentations today. Um, they're somewhat related, um, although that might not be exactly evident from what I'm showing. But we can talk about that um, offline if, if it's not clear. So the first one I'm talking about is uh, Project Gemini, which is not related to the NASA project. Um, this is a um, in-house AFRL project in which we're working on um, gradient-based, um, or moving towards gradient-based optimization using measures of effectiveness. So what I'm gonna be showing today um, is really the process that we're taking moving from, uh, to include mission analyses into MDO problems, and specifically gradient-based optim uh, optimization problems, this is actually a very, very challenging problem. And so I want to give you an idea of how, what, what this path looks like. Um, for starters, I'm going to have to tell you a little bit about EBD, or effectiveness-based design, what we, mean when, what, um, what we mean by that term. Then I'm going to talk to you briefly, I mean very briefly, about past and current um, contracted research efforts, and then where Gemini um, fits in in that context. So let's start out by giving some definitions. What do I mean by effectiveness-based design? So I figured I'm at NASA, so I was going to show a picture of the CRM. But we need to start with some definitions here. So there are two really key terms I'm going to be using. One is measures of effect, uh, measures of performance, excuse me, um, which if you're at, at um, you know, if you deal with the military, you'll see that there's an alphabet soup of, of acronyms that we tend to use, and we tend to use, uh, the one that we give here is MOP. Um, so this is a metric quantifying vehicle performance that sort of comes from the name. Um, but what we mean in this context is, you know, speed, weight, so maximum takeoff weight range, um, lift, drag, like if you're minimizing drag, that's minimizing an MOP. And the second definition I want to give you guys is measures of effectiveness. Um, I've seen varying uh, definitions on this front, and it depends what field you're working in sometimes, but the context in which I'm using it in is it's a metric um, that quantifies the effectiveness of a vehicle to, or a system to fulfill a mission. So sticking with the CRM example here, um, you know, that might be seat mile cost. Um, for a more military vehicle, that might be something like IDs per dollar, um, something like that. So that's all fine and good, um, but airplanes are sometimes a little bit hard to visualize what EBD means. So the example I like to give is um, think of cars. You know, everyone sort of has a handle for cars. You usually drive them, especially in the United States, you have to drive cars. Um, so imagine that you have a design space of a rubberized car. You can do anything with this car. Um, like in terms of, you can put, build a massive engine on it, you can make a really small engine, you can make it really sleek, you can make it a box. We don't have any design variables that can do anything with it. So if we're trying to optimize top speed, um, we get something like this. It's almost all engine has a, basically a dart of a body, and this is actually the current, I believe, the current um, world speed land record, land speed record holder. So you get this kind of vehicle if you're trying to optimize speed, which is a measure of performance. Um, now, if you're trying to race, you know, say Formula One or IndyCar, you don't really want to optimize for speed, although that might be the initial guess is that you might, might want to optimize for speed, but you're actually optimizing for something like lap time. And lap time in this context would be a measure of effectiveness. And so what you get if you're optimizing for that is, say, a Formula One car, 
And this, I guess, in honor of Red Bull winning the world championship yesterday. Uh, I like Red Bull, uh, the, the racing team. Um, so what I'm trying to highlight here is, is that you can take an MOP, which is actually the standard measure that we, or MOPs are the standard measures that we use for objective functions when we do conceptual design. So you know, minimize fuel burn, minimize take um, structural weight. These really fall into the category of MOPs, but if we're looking at mission effectiveness, the optimal you know, MOP optimization does not automatically give us the best and the most effective vehicle. So before I keep on going in terms of where this fits in with um, our in-house efforts, I do want to go through what has been done in the past. Um, because there, there's a long lineage specifically within Mystic to fund um, contracted efforts towards um, effectiveness-based design. And so there's, there may be more. Um, these are the ones that I'm familiar with. Is that there's, there's really three uh, contracts that have moved EBD forward. Um, the first starting with Optimus, and I don't actually have the exact years in mind. It was quite a bit before I got to the Air Force. But they basically, uh, this was a Boeing, um, uh, a contract with Boeing where they worked on subsystem modeling and transient um, modeling of those subsystems, I believe. Then, uh, more recently, and it's technically still active, um, we have the Expedite program. And uh, disclaimer, I'm, I'm the AFRL uh, PM for e Expedite, so I sort of naturally would want to show it here. But um, so Expedite dealt with mission effectiveness more head on. So it actually includes mission analysis within AFSIM, which I'll get into in a second what AFSIM is, but it's a modeling tool. As well as uh, retaining, the, um, retaining the subsystem modeling from Optimus. And then in the current efforts that are starting to wind down, the, um, it includes some manufacturing constraints um, and an add on task. And then, uh, another, then finally, another effort that's ongoing is um, it's an effort called Equate, which is run by Northrop Grumman, um, which focuses on um, mission effectiveness and uncertainty quantification. So I do want to zero in on the Expedite program. It's obviously you know the middle program in that list. But um, Gemini actually grew out of Expedite. Um, so Gemini was originally called in-house expedite, and then we gave a different acronym moving forward. But um, I'm not going to go through what expedite stands for other than it does include the word effectiveness in it. Um, the, the main things that were shown inside of expedite were really that you, know, you could do subsystem modeling. This is still gradient free. And in the next presentation, I'll give you an example of where that's changing. Um, but for now, we're talking gradient-free subsystem modeling, PTMS modeling, power, sorry, there's the alphabet soup again, uh, power thermal management system modeling. Um, then mission analysis so that had AFSIM in, um, simulations that could be run in the loop. And then um, something that actually doesn't exactly play into this um, presentation, but I thought was interesting in this forum was business-to-business -business MDO integration. I consider this actually something that's relatively important when we look at industrial scale um, MDO. And it's something that's actually one point where I would argue um, open MDO still probably needs to have some work done on it. And then, as I mentioned before, there's, there's the manufacturing work that is ongoing in terms of taking manufacturing constraints and putting them into conceptual design. So, as I mentioned, Expedite, uh, sorry, Gemini grew out of Expedite. Um, originally, Gemini had all caps. Um, as it turns out, the program manager, um, in this case me, couldn't remember what every single letter stood for. And it doesn't really look good in review when you stand up and you can't tell people what Gemini stands for. Um, so I decided to lowercase it. Um, I will say G stands for gradient based, and E stands for effectiveness. And don't ask me anything more about that. I think M is mission, but I can't remember. <laughs> so let's go back to this example that I mentioned before. Um, 
We have a rubberized car. We already know that top speed is not what we want to optimize for. Track speed is. This is our, our current example. But the problem becomes more complex than this. Because, sure, we have to optimize track speed. Sounds simple. Yeah, except we actually have to have a track to optimize against, right? So we say, okay, we want to optimize it for Monaco, really slow speed circuit. Um, yeah, for people who follow Formula One, that's usually not a good idea. It's a very slow circuit, it won't perform well overall, so you have to include other circuits. The Italians in the room will be happy I mentioned Monza. Um, it's a very high speed circuit. And then, you know, you have something which combines both high speed and lower speed portions. And if you're looking at effectiveness-based design, you have to consider all these things because you're not looking at a single track and optimizing you know, lap time for a single track. You're trying to make sure that your vehicle performs well across its entire operating spectrum, right? And this obviously transfers to air vehicles as well. So as I mentioned before, if we look at these tracks here, don't really want to belabor the fact too much, but you have very, very different requirements. Some are really low speed with high downforce settings. Some are really high speed with very low um, downforce settings. And then you have something that sees a little bit of both, and you have to accommodate both of these. Um, you know, having to accommodate those is not enough. We actually have to have a way to model it. So I don't, I'm not an expert in terms of what they use in Formula One, so I'm going to go back to the air vehicle side. But if we, the analogy still holds, right? So we're trying to optimize a vehicle and we need a tool to model our track or our mission in this case, right? So the tools that I'm familiar with on this front are um, AFSIM, which is an Air Force um, controlled tool. It was originally developed at Boeing, I believe. There's STK, which stands for, I believe, now the Systems Toolkit. It used to be a Satellite Toolkit. Um, which is, I believe, pretty commonplace in spacecraft design or satellite systems. But as far as I know, it can do very similar things to AFSIM. And then GMAT, which I believe there's a presentation tomorrow. Yeah, right. Um, I mentioned GMAT in this context. I think they're a little bit different between these three in terms of their application and as much as I think AFSIM and STK probably could do similar things to GMAT. But they are multi-domain, and I think, if I remember correctly, GMAT is not multi-domain in terms of, but which, you know, every tool has its own reason exists. But we're looking at um, air vehicles, but potentially multi-domain applications. So in this case, we're looking at AFSIM. Well, there's a few reasons why. One is because it's a very, it's a very capable mission simulation framework. It is multi-domain. It does allow us to use varying levels of fidelity um, for mover models. And movers are, in this case, like the you know, aircraft equations of motion. So when I say varying levels of fidelity, we can have really uh, basic mover models that are kind of hand wavy in terms of how you apply them. They're like single degree of freedom kind of stuff. And then you can have you know, full sixth off um, uh, models in there. And then there's something in between, like two and a half DOF, which is what we use. Um, one of the big reasons we use this is obviously because it's government controlled source code, so we get it for free. Not only do we get it for free, well, the government certainly gets it for free. Um, we also, you know, have ways to get involved with the developers and we have a close relationship with the maintainers of the code. The code itself is modular, which is important in this context because uh, you know, we want to be able to integrate tools for EBD. And then um, it is actually a standard tool. Um, I'm not sure if you're familiar with it, but it is a standard tool that is used both heavily by government as well as industry. Um, I did mention movers. So in this context, we, use, we don't use the full six DOF system I was talking about. We don't use the one DOF system because that's too low fidelity. Six DOF requires way too much information that we don't have available necessarily at conceptual design phase. So we use um, the Rome Mover pl plugin. That's actually a rebranded version. That's the mover model formerly known as ROAVs. Um, that's probably only important to people who've gotten this. So there's only a handful of corporations who've gotten this. But in any case, it's a two and a half DOF uh, mover model. So it basically allows you to 
model your heading and then you know your altitude. Um, is a um, AFSM mover model that was developed um, at AFRL, so RQVC, the branch I work in, in conjunction with PCK, that's PC Cross and Associates. Um, and this does include some uh, guidance and navigation control for way, uh, waypoint charting and some controllers, et cetera, inside there. Then, um, so in terms of what we need for this is, it, it takes a really simple model, actually. So we need to input some weights. We have to put a five-column engine deck into this, and we have to ultimately give it some aerodynamic information. When I say aerodynamic information, it's really very rudimentary. It's, you know, basically lift curve and drag polar, but like, polar, not data points, but actually like, you know, CD naught, K drag, um, you know, the drag offset of the polar. So we took um, the AFSIM, we're using AFSIM as our, as our driver for the mission analysis, and uh, we ultimately need to put this into an optimization, right? So what we did over about a year's time is we wrapped this into an open MDO component. So this is actually still a relatively modular approach. Um, the inputs, as I mentioned, are predefined as weights, engine data, and aero data. And then I say MOEs coming out the other end. I'm very unspecific at that point in time. And the reason I'm not being specific is because that part is modular. We can actually define um, using functions. We can define exactly what quantity of interest we, we get out of AFSIM at that point. Um, the one thing, people who know me is I'm not a big fan of file I.O. in optimization. I, matter of fact, I very much dislike it. I like API calls when possible. Um, I also like analytical gradients, which is not surprising given where I, <laughs> the MDO class I took at Michigan. But um, unfortunately, none of these things are available from AFSIM, at least currently. So, um, I mean, the API is available, but it's not exposed to Python, so essentially we're stuck with writing an input file, executing a system call, running it, and reading the output file um, for the time being, which is, you know, perfectly fine for the moment being. Um, it does mean, though, that for um, gradient-based evaluations, we have to do fine differencing, which I'm, you know, not overly fond of, generally speaking. So looking at, you know, we have the component built up now, but this needs to fit into a larger optimization pro problem. And so the way this, this happens is, you know, ultimately in our XDSM, XDSM AFSIM sits at the bottom right corner. But we, need, we still need to find a way to provide all the data. Even in the simplest optimization problem, we have to find a way to give the data to AFSIM. So I mentioned before, weights are simple, right? We get that from our Raymer weight analysis or any other statistical conceptual design level analysis. Then we can get aero data. Uh, well, the five column engine deck we'll just assume is fixed and we're not changing for now. And then we need aero data. But we generally don't, you know, if we're trying to do actual shape optimization, you don't really want to work with a polar. So what we do in this context is we're actually running several higher fidelity analyses. In this case, it's open arrow struct, although we can theoretically swap this out for other solvers, where we then obtain a fixed number of points and we fit a polar through that um, and then fit that uh, and give that polar fit and the other data to AFSIM. With the exception of AFSIM in this case, every other block that I'm showing here is actually differentiated. So we are moving towards gradient-based optimization. It's just the AFSIM block that still is has to be fine at difference. And, and unfortunately, that's a lot of inputs, actually. That, that can be very, 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 very many inputs. So just to give you an idea of what we're looking at here, this is a highly notional mission. There's, there's really nothing, nothing realistic about this in terms of where it is or what it's doing. But we have a notional mission where we're flying this, you know, strain gauge patterned search mission somewhere over the continental United States. Um, that search mission, you know, as the vehicle flies along, you can see this green little sensor cone down there. Um, that's how we track some points of interest that are on the ground. So, probably can't see it, certainly I can't see it from here, but there's yellow lines within the, the that, um, green cone. That yellow line actually indicates that a point of, point of interest is visible. And so as we, as the vehicle flies along, it'll captures several of these points of interest as it flies along. And um, 
Well, then the question is what's the, uh, the measure of effectiveness in this context? That, that, that's one, another point we have to define. And um, because typically speaking from an operations perspective, you'd say, I see you. I see you, that's two. I see you, that's three. And so you're counting, really. That's integers, they're not continuous, <laughs> logically speaking, which means A, you can't find a difference that, and B, it doesn't matter because it's not continuous to begin with and not differentiable to begin with. So you really can't do gradient-based with that. And so um, we need to move away from a discrete metric, which is obviously not suited for gradient-based optimization, and need to move towards a continuous metric. In, the, in this context, the continuous metric I came up with was what I call time with eyes on target. So that's basically, if you take all those yellow, yellow lines I was showing, and um, basically you integrate all the time, or you add up all the times that those, those points of interest are, are visible, then you get time which is continuous. So if you, you know, change a design variable, you might increase the time, you might decrease the time. It's no longer counting it, but it's continuous. Um, and so we're using this then in, in that context for an MOE, and we're maximizing that, so we're trying to maximize the amount of time that we can have these points of interest in, in view. Because we're dealing first with a gradient-free optimization and then with um, with you know, finite differencing, and certainly at the beginning at a top level finite differencing, we want to keep the level of design variables low. So in this case, we have three, which are the span, the taper ratio, and the root, the chord root, uh, root chord, excuse me. And then there's some constraints that are added, mainly to make sure that the vehicle you know, can still fly its return legs. So there's an ingress portion to the mission, there's a search pattern, and then there's an egress portion. And we just want to make sure that it remain, remains feasible that I can still get home. Right, and those, that's where the constraints come in. And so an initial um, problem that we set up was with uh, a genetic algorithm with a simple GA driver, I believe, in, in OpenMDO. And even with low population sizes, because we can't actually run this in parallel because of file I.O. bottlenecks, we end up with you know, four and a half to six hour kind of durations to run an optimization, which, you know, for starters, it's maybe not bad, but if you're trying to move on to larger uh, numbers of design variables, it can get tedious. So um, we need to move forward with that. There is one aspect that I haven't touched on, though, and that's um, I'm showing uh, one of the early optimization or one of the iterations from one of the early optimizations here. And I can't really go into too much detail here, mainly because it's just way too technical for this kind of presentation. But one of the problems we ran into early, and you can actually see that it's an early presentation because I'm using different um, design variables here. Sweep is actually a design variable in this context. But what actually happened here is that we got a whole bunch of failed AFSIM runs here. It just wouldn't complete. And so basically you'd get some that are fine and you get some that weren't. And in an optimization context, this just doesn't work because Ultimately, and this is GA, this is not even finite differencing or gradient based. What happens ultimately is when you see a snapshot like this is that parts of the, the design space that were actually totally fine were being negatively biased by the optimizer. In other words, the optimizer was moving away from these failed points just because it failed. In many cases, it was actually just failing trim checks, which you know is an operational condition, not actually a design condition. So we have to mitigate that. We were able to mitigate it. But what I'm trying to say is there, there was actually a hardening process that was required for AFSIM to, uh, to be used in this context. And so we, we actually ultimately were able to run some uh, gradient-free results, and you can see the result here. Well, you know, I started out by saying um, that you don't necessarily want to optimize your measure of performance because your measure of effectiveness might not result in the same configuration. Um, Oops, because that's probably actually just a maximum loiter problem right there. And if one thinks it through, that, that, that's exactly what happened. Now, I, I will say I knew that before we went into this. Um, and that was actually part of the reason we did this was so that we had a verifiable um, you know, solution that we could look up against. Now, there's additional results, unfortunately, that are more recent that there's always a clearance process that we have to go through, so I can't go through additional results. If you are interested in further results of this, 
Um, I will be presenting um, our research on this at SciTech in January, which should have quite a bit more on that. Um, right, so just to wrap things up, I wanted to say, from our perspective, optimizing effectiveness really is a necessity. There, there are cases in which, that, as I mentioned before, optimizing performance is not equal to optimizing effectiveness. Um, unfortunately, this does involve having to have a mission or operational analysis tool in the mix, which does you know, make things significantly harder. Nonetheless, um, at A4L, we were able to automate the AFSIM execution, which in it for itself was quite, quite some work. And then we were able to conduct some gradient-free optimizations. Uh, we do have some ongoing research in the gradient-based optimizations, which I do expect to show in SciTech, as I mentioned. And um, then on the OpenMDO side, I wanted to mention one thing. And I, I really love OpenMDO. And I think I told this to, to uh, Justin uh, right as I was getting ready to defend. I, I think I, my words were, it was my single favorite tool from my PhD. Um, I, I'm pretty sure those were the words I used. I still love it. It is, it is a very nice tool to prototype. But I do want to emphasize that in, in the context of industrial scale applications, there is some, some room for, for development, I, I do believe. Maybe a lot of room for development? I'm trying to be diplomatic. <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, um, that's my talk for effectiveness. So if you have any questions, I'll be glad to answer them. Thank you very much, much Chris. <laughs> yes, if you have any specifics on how we can make it uh, better for the industrial uh, design, uh, let us know. Um, so questions for Chris. We have about five minutes of questions. And OK. I have a question while well, you bring the mic over. Um, my understanding of effectiveness-based design is pretty weak, but I, it sounds a lot like it would mesh well with like UQ, like it's kind of a UQ-ish type objective. Yeah. Um, <laughs> ben, so, I'm, I'm looking at you, Ben. So it does, it does mesh well with UQ. Um, we do treat it a little bit separately because there are, as I mentioned before, this might look like a really simple problem. It's incredibly difficult to actually get working. Mm -hmm. So we treat them as separate, separate problems for now, but ultimately, UQ absolutely is directly related to effectiveness. So I guess what I was getting at there is whether or not you're going to solve a UQ problem. Maybe some of the techniques between UQ and some of the quadrature stuff that we do in Dimos might provide a path for, for like an optimization gradient compatible effectiveness-based design objective. Um, so I'm not sure if I completely understood the question, but I. I with respect to Dimos and um, the implicit stuff, when I first got to AFRL, that was, it was like, got solved, we're gonna use Dimos. Yeah. And um, there was some eye rolling when I, <laughs> yeah. when, when I said something along those lines and um, with good reason because the, the problems we're looking at there are significantly more complex. I, I didn't mean to imply that you would solve it in Dimos, but just some of the, Dimos uses like an under, underlying quadrature to like form some of its math and sure. so, we kind of know that we can do quadratures. I think you might be able to express EBD as a quadrature. Some of the UQ methods are also quadratures. I guess I'm asking slash commenting. There might be like some intersection there we could work on yeah, to give you a way to get derivatives of an EBD objective function. Sure. Yeah, so thanks for the presentation. I actually have a question that's maybe more on the expedite side, just because you brought it up first. Mm -hmm. uh, you talked about manufacturing constraints. Yeah. And it looks like you're using tools that are, if you want, on the lower fidelity side of the spectrum, like you don't have like 3D finite element models, for example, or this kind of stuff. So I was wondering how these constraints are included like in Expedite and I assume also in Gemini, as far as you can tell us. So when I said uh, Gemini grew out of Expedite, I probably stepped in it a little bit because it was called in-house Expedite, which, was, which mirrored the, um, the Expedite contract. And so happened to be nice because Gemini means as twins, and so I, you know, I, I milked that one for what it was worth. But um, the, the the thing is that Expedite and Gemini do not actually share a tool set. They they're completely separate, and the manufacturing is not being done in ha not well. There are manufacturing efforts in house. They are not in Gemini. Um, does that answer your question? Yeah, I mean, uh, I was just curious because, yeah, never mind. Because the Gemini, again, it's like, it looks like it's lower, like you mentioned, open aerostruct and other things. So I, I was just confused there. But 
Yes, yeah, so this kind of covers the, the question. So the XDSM I showed is very, very simple. And the reason it's simple is because the problem itself is hard. And so we need a baseline to work off of to get it to, get it to work. Um, in the context of a larger design problem, one can transplant the EBD part into a more complex design problem. And open air struct is low fidelity, and you could theoretically do this with a higher fidelity tool. So I, I'm not. Um, I think it's all applicable in that context. I don't want, really want to go through the details of manufacturing because it's an ongoing contract. And mm -hmm. thank you. Any other questions for Chris? Oh. Yeah, we have a question. Hey, uh, Manny Diaz from NASA Marshall. Um, I've seen EBD uh, implementations and like the hypersonics uh, from from your org. Um, can you can you comment uh, if you're thinking of uh, implementing Exergy EBD, Exergy based EBD for this work? <laughs> There's the H word. Um, it would make sense in general terms that such systems could have EBD applied to it. Um, I don't really want to comment further in terms of, of whether or not we're applying it. Cool. And as, as a suggestion for you, um, we have some tips and tricks using like legacy tools that have file I.O. and trying to do like finite differencing on that. Um, there's some available things you could do like using a RAM disk or something. That way you don't have hard drive in the loop, you have RAM in the loop. And that will speed up things a lot more while you get rid of file I.O. that takes longer usually. So I'm happy to share some notes with you. Sure, thanks. Uh, okay. So when you showed the, uh, the race car example with different tracks, it reminded me of uh, like multi-objective multi optimization problems. So um, I guess it's also a question for the open MDAO uh, community. Like, uh, have you tried solving treating problems as like a multi-objective problem and trying to use uh, MDAO approaches? And how would you? How would you solve those problems? So, a few things to unpack there. Um, yeah, it, it, it becomes a multi-objective problem in, in, in terms of if you have multiple tracks, but the objective is different. So, compared to what we typically deal with nowadays. Uh, so, if you're looking at multiple design points in more traditional um, optimization or conceptual aircraft design problem, you're still dealing with MOPs. And as I mentioned before, you may be, I mean, as, as I showed here, it, it, it doesn't preclude that the MOP optimization results in the MOE result, but it's not guaranteed, which is why we still need to do this with effectiveness. And then the multi-objective part is sort of a separate thing on that front. I was just trying to say, you know, you have the track optimization, then in a real realistic problem, you'd have to look over multiple tracks. No, I'm pretty sure the F1 guys customize their car for every track. <laughs> I think we have, uh, we have time for one more question. One more question for Chris on this topic. Do you, do you think that the um, AFSIM, AFSIM uh, people are open to uh, putting gradient-friendly aspects into the code? I hope so. Because <laughs> um, I, I think yeah. the thing that, that made me think of it is you, you, you switched the, the metric to like integrating one whenever, you know, integrating one whenever you can see, see a target. Um, but I feel like long term you might have more success in a gradient based approach if, if you can smooth, smooth that step function out basically. Um, yeah, I, I don't disagree. Um, I'm just so there's a lot of stuff I'm not showing in terms of where I think it would naturally head, um, but for the time being, so I'm pretty much showing where things are at mm -hmm. um, and what we can do at this point in time. Obviously, I would love to have gradients from AFSIM, and then it becomes a matter of every mission you have to sort of try and make a continuous metric so that you can differentiate it. 